host. You could all hear me anyway, couldn't you? Didn't need it. Didn't need it. Anyway, um, this is the statutory speculation. Now, sometimes it's tough keeping out of trouble. Sometimes breaking the law can be easy, yeah? Sometimes you can even do it on accident. But this masterclass is an opportunity to get the inside track from industry professionals and how we can avoid falling foul of the long arm of the law. How does that sound good? Nobody wants to be a lawbreaker, do they? Want to end up in jail? No, thank you. This is how you survive and thrive in the complex world of entertainment, and it's going to be fun. So uh, without further ado, let's welcome our panel. It's Theo Jones, Emily Edwards, and Mark Price. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Come in, guys. Take a seat, take a seat. Pour yourself a tasty beverage of water. Thank you. It's lovely. Come, come. Don't be shy. Thank you. How are we doing, guys? Good. How is everybody? Good. There you go. Good. That's, that's, so that's, we, that's we, we, we agreed. We agreed. Yeah, we agreed outside that <laughs> we pour water good. straight away. That's what we talk about out there. Um, very exciting. <laughs> uh, so, how's everyone doing today? Good. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So, why don't we start off by just working our way down the line and introducing ourselves? Oh no, I'm still pouring water. Oh, shit, yeah, I spilled yeah. it all over. There. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can start with you then, Emily. He's, he's, he's busy at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name's Emily. I'm a lawyer. I work for Clinton's, which is a media and entertainment firm, and I'm in their film and television team. Cool. Um, yeah, hand over. Um, I work for the Society of Authors, which is a, an independent trade union for writers, illustrators, novelists, um, you name it, um, but also script writers. Um, and I co, uh, man well, I'm a contract advisor at the society, um, and I co-manage the um, scriptwriters group. So, uh, representing members and makers, uh, writers and makers for t TV, film, radio, and emerging AV media, increasingly. Yeah. You just do it all. Well, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. And uh, Mark. Um, I'm Mark. I'm a filmmaker. Um, I, I may have circumvented the law a little bit. <laughs> making my cheap movies, and I think I'm here to explain myself. Yes, <laughs> and to be held accountable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, at least say what you can get away with, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've got two lawyers sitting next to you, so they'll help you out. They'll just, <laughs> yeah, you guys will just be going. Yeah, <coughs> don't do that. Don't do that. on the all they can break. <laughs> um, <laughs> so why don't we just jump straight into it? Um, I want to start off by talking a bit about rights and protection, you know, the rights and protections we have as creative people, as artists. Um, now, if you're any type of creative person, you know, artist, musician, performer, filmmaker, I'm sure there's a lot of you out there today. Um, how can you protect creations that you have taken, that have taken all your hard work? You know, you, you, you put all this hard work into things, but you often don't think about how you can protect that, you know? So how do we go about doing something like that? Just jump right in. <laughs> don't be, don't be, don't how be do shy. How you protect yeah, your like, rights? Yeah. I think when you're making a film, you need to understand that there are lots of different layers of rights. I mean, the analogy of an onion is a bit cliched, but there really are. Um, from the script writer will have their rights, the director, the different producers, everybody's putting in a little bit of their own creativity into it. Um, there's also a whole bunch of underlying rights belonging to third parties. We call third parties, which just basically means other people. So you might be using a piece of music that already exists, or um, you might be panning across a city and there are buildings that have uh, all sorts of architectural rights in them. There's an advert which has a trademark in it. So there are all those different layers that you need to be aware of mm -hmm. um, and cover off in your various contracts. Yeah, I've kind of got a question already, actually. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite handy. Save the Q&A till later, please, Mark. <laughs> That's at the end. This is good, this is good, this is good. <laughs> um, so it's, there's a, a friend of mine made a film recently, and he's reluctant to release it on Amazon because he's got cans of beer and stuff like that in it. Mm -hmm. And I've said to him, you don't have to worry about that. I said, that's fine, you can use those things. The reason the BBC don't like that is to do with the fact that they usually charge for product placement. And by bringing in a can of Coke on an episode yeah. of uh, you know, The Cry, without it being sanctioned, Coke can be like a great free advertising. So is, is that, I th I've always assumed that that was the reason. I said, no, you can, as long as you're not using a can of Carlsberg to bludgeon someone to death. <laughs> Man, if Carlsberg made blunt <laughs> objects to <laughs> killing, you know, <laughs> Children. That's kind of that's getting their name out, right? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I assume that like you could just use it for anything, provided you don't use it in any way that's destructive. That's so moral rights. We're moving. Bad on guys to drinking. That, yeah. I mean, is, is that a problem? Or is that just a really bad question? I mean, tech. There you go. Well, I don't know. I mean, 
There is a an exception under copyright law for, I mean, if indeed copyright is found to be subsisting mm. in that can. Um, there's a prote- there's an exemption, a carve out for incidental usage. Um, okay. So if you're, uh, I don't know, unwrapping a chocolate bar or having a quick can of Coke, it's not, uh, you know, you're not sort of making use of the value in, wi- in which subsists in that brand. Right. Um, I think if we sat here as a panel and we have the cans here and we're, we're somehow trying to show that Coke has endorsed us in some way, that mm. kind of thing, there, there could be some problems right, that right. you might encounter mm. there. Um, and uh, I don't know, you may know more about this, but the, the changes that are that are um, that we're potentially going to see in the, in the design right aspect, which is a subsidiary right uh, under copyright, um, that may also mean there are some things to, be, to watch out for mm. right, in okay. the future. So it is definitely worth paying consideration to it. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's yeah. great. That's good to know. It might, it might be worth taking it back a little step and just talking about what copyright actually is. Um, I mean, everyone's seen the little C in the circle, right? It's like, show of hands, C in the circle. Who's seen the C in the circle? Yeah, we've all seen the C in the circle. Um, but what, is, what does that actually mean? Is, 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 it a, is it a case where as soon as you make a piece of art or work, you own the copyright to it? Or, is it, or do you need some sort of like legal hoo-ha? Well, to, uh, do you need to sign something? Things have changed because uh, there's the, big, the famous case with Night of the Living Dead where it was initially called something like Night of something else, uh, Night of the Dead or something like that. But then it was changed to Night of the Living Dead, but they f- neglected to put the copyright C on. And as a result, that film's been in a public domain since it's been released. Wow. So they never made any money off that film uh, it, to, to a degree, I think. So Romero sort of created the most successful modern monster. Yeah. But because of that one little accidental omission, that film, they, 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 he didn't own the rights to that film. So any one of us could start a distribution company and release that movie now. Um, so at, at least that's one of the things that I've heard about. But since then, I think it's, there's more to it than that now. Like a lot more to it than that, isn't it? So Because films don't have that anymore. Mm. It's, that's yeah. Um, I'm, copyright exists once the creation, the work, comes into existence. So if you have an idea for a film, you don't have rights in it. But as soon as you make it, as soon as you write the script, that... Right. copyright in that work exists and it's yours so you don't have to sign anything you don't have to make anything it's just no. as soon as you create it you if, own the copyright yeah but the problem is if i um if i draw a picture today and i keep it in my drawer for two years and you draw the exact same picture just by pure coincidence in a year's time um and then you sell yours it becomes really famous can I turn around and say, do you know what? I created it first. I think you copied me there. Chicken or egg situation. It's more. Copyright. It's more. You can say, well, I didn't know that existed. You know. So how do you prove that your work came into existence first? And a lot of people used to email themselves their work. Used to um, send send it to a publisher or a lawyer so that they'd have some um, date on it. Nowadays, you can simply put it on the internet, right? Mm, yeah. And then that date marks it for you. Yeah. Yeah, don't be confused by the, the services out there that will that are sort of registration services. You don't need to register your works in order for copyright to apply and in, or, in order to be afforded the full protection at law. Um, the only the benefit that they give you is that they will allow you to prove that you created the work that you said you did when you said you did. And as you were saying, I think if you, if you share that, you know, if you... The act of you sharing it via an encrypted email server that you can later, you know, demonstrate that you know that you had that, you know, you created that work when you said you did. But I mean, even saving on, saving on an external hard drive or or a, you know, a cloud, um, that all that all helps. Um, it is different in the, in America. You can't bring copyright infringement action unless you have registered your work. Um, but as far as I'm aware, you're able to do that. If you think that your work has been infringed in the US, you can then register the work and bring the action. You don't have to have registered the work before the infringement has incurred, if you see what I mean. So it's not something that you should feel that you should jump up and do. Um, and um, yeah. yeah. All right. So, so say you've, uh, you've done that, then you've created the work, you've done all the, all the hard graft, uh, you've got your copyright by, by, by bringing this piece of art into the universe. Um, and then you find out that someone's been screening your movie and, uh, and, and, and making money off ticket sales. Can you just walk up to them and say, like, where's my cut, mate? What's going on here? I was, come on, <laughs> hand it over. I, I guess technically you could sue them. Um, that's expensive. Nobody actually wants to be doing that. I mean, I'm the lawyer who's um, doing myself out of 
So <laughs> is it um, underselling myself? Don't but hire me. <laughs> yeah, don't hire me unless you have to, because it's expensive. The best thing to do is to find a way to settle outside of uh, outside of lawyers. So if you can get in touch with the person and say, look, mate, you owe me some money. I don't know if you realize I own the rights to this thing. And they pay you off and you're happy. You're both happy. Happy days. Great. Yeah. Right? Rather than bringing an action against them, mm. which you technically can do, but probably don't want to do. Unless you are a huge film, you are a massive movie studio, and you're losing millions, and it's worth spending the money mm. on bringing a big action. So don't bother if it's just a little short film being shown in Villa Ricky. you can sort it out without yeah. the lawyers. <laughs> in an upstairs pub somewhere. <laughs> don't, yeah. And don't worry about it so much. All right, cool. That's really interesting. Um, so... That kind of brings us on to copyright clearance. So for anyone that doesn't know, I didn't know this until about two days ago when I did my homework. But um, if, if like you've heard a song that you really like, for example, or, or seen a piece of like news footage, for example, and you really need to put it in your film, like you, you really, really want that in, in, in your movie, or just someone else's work that you want to put inside there, how would you go about doing that? And, and what are the risks of doing that without someone's permission? You probably have more experience of um, I think, yeah, with, uh, to be honest, I've always gone the safe route and I've contacted people who either compose the music or, uh, or a band, a local band. I've never really gone for, say, you know, uh, Cypress Hill, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's going to cost a lot of money and we just don't have the budgets for it. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 to be honest, it's not really come up. I have guys that do YouTube content, uh, friends who do YouTube content, and they often use, if they do a, something to do, to do with Star Wars, they want to use Star Wars music to help sell the emotion of what they're trying to talk about passionately. And I think the, that's more to do with uh, sort of like the, the certain documentaries and content. I'm not sure how it works in YouTube, but you're allowed to under the fair use. Is that is that right? And I don't know a great deal about that, but... Um, it's something that those guys have done. But for me, I always go to people who say, yes, you can use this. Here you go. Here's, your song. Here's the mm. song. Not a problem. Um, but again, you've got to make sure that they're the rights users. I know that there was an instance where someone asked Duncan Jones why in the making of Moon he didn't use any David Bowie songs. And he said, well, I would have loved to and my dad would have been cool with it. But he, he's not allowed to decide whether that goes in because there's a record label that makes money off that and they can't make those decisions and they don't care if we're related. Mm. If I haven't got the budget for it, I'm not using it. So I went with Chesney Hawks. Yeah. You know? uh, so there's little things like that that I know happen, but it's not as, it's not as I don't think there's an easy way around it in film, in features at least. I'm not sure about shorts. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts there, isn't there? Mm. You have to kind of get clearance from. Does, does that pertain to like, say, people and places? If you're like making a, a documentary, for example, can you just get your camera out and just point and shoot at everything? Or, 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 or would you need permission I, for that? I have done that, and I know that Shane Meadows does that. Yeah, I think Shane Meadows for a while at least didn't, even when he was quite successful, didn't bother with permits. Everyone liked him, so he just showed up, was friendly, filmed the scenes and moved on. Um, without can that come back to bite you in the bum, though? What's that? Uh, well, I did it in Colin. I didn't have any permission to shoot anywhere in Tooting, and no one's... No one's come at me yet. It's been like a decade now, so I think I'm all right. Yeah. How many people is this streaming to? Um, yeah, but like six people ain't going to go. Technically, you get appearance clear, uh, rights, releases from everybody who's in the background of your mm. film. People, um, yeah, definitely, we have that. So Yeah, yeah. and you can get a one-page form um, that basically says you allow us to use your image in the background of this film and... If you just, on the day, get everyone to sign the same, you've got yeah. 100 copies of the piece of paper, everyone who ends up in shot, you get them to sign the yeah. same, then you've saved yourself potentially a lot of grief. Yeah, there was, um, uh, I know of someone who did a music video and uh, they didn't get everyone to sign. They chased everyone up, got everyone to sign, it was fine, but one person went, ooh, mm. no. Pay, yeah. pay me a grand. And they're like, what? You're, in, you're like, we were going to give you 20 quid for the day because now pay me a grand. Yeah. And insisted, and they were panicking, thinking we have to pay this person a grand, otherwise you can't use the video because that guy pushed himself to the front of every shot. But it turns out that it, the, yeah. the emails, though, that were back and forth, do you want to be in this? Yeah, you cool being in this music video. I can't wait. I'd love to. I'd love to be in a music video. Oh, I'm going to be at the front of every shot. It's all in an email. So they went, ah, got this. So yeah. they didn't have to pay him anything. It was it counted as permission. Can, yeah. can that cover your back? I don't know if you have any experience with contracts and emails in, in the past for any of your projects, but can that cover your back through email? Um, 
I think so. I mean, I've found it's okay. I mean, yeah. th I, I mean, I would go about this quite differently. I mean, I generally work with people who want to be there, and we just say, okay, sign this before you even step in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't got a pen. Can I do it after? No. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we just be very, you know, yeah. be very sort of strict about it. Yeah. Um, we had an instance where someone's agent, who's been very difficult with this, hadn't got the actor to sign. And I didn't know this until on the day, and I said, nope, make sure that person signs. Mm -hmm. so we had um, one of our sort of uh, runners sort of go up and say, hi, can you sign this for us so we can start shooting with you? He goes, oh, is this the contract? He goes, yeah, yeah. She goes, oh, okay, cool. Assumed it was all fine because the, <laughs> the agent had sent her, but because she signed it, that's it, it's fine. That's it. She didn't have to worry, you know, all the crap the agent was giving us. We're like, it's been signed. Didn't, oh, didn't you have a, a situation with um, something to do with credits? Yeah, we had it. That didn't cover, and it, emails. Saved you. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting one actually because we had um, I'd, I'd done a film and there was a dispute on the part of the agent, which concerned me and kind of annoyed me because I thought, why are we speaking with an agent? Our business concluded the second we started shooting and you signed their contract. Why are they even having conversations with us? It's all in a contract, right? It's yeah. all written down. And it was to do with the order of a couple of her clients that were in the film. And I was like, I'm not having my credits order dictated to me by a goddamn fucking agent. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, it was, I was like, it's just, no, not at all. So, um, but we designed these lovely credits. Yeah. Uh, because what was covered in the contract, which I, I kind of wasn't aware of, was how it appears in the scroll, the credit scroll. But that meant I could still do, you know, like the Marvel credits where you have the cool yeah. names and all the, the, the title cards and, yeah. So we'd done those for our cast and it was, and everyone looked awesome. Uh, but then this, this agent said, nope. Nope, nope, you can't do that. And I went, well, you didn't put anything in the contract. She said, she, she realized, oh, okay, we're in trouble. Went to an old email and said, ah, look, in the email you said you put this actor there. And what was, what was the issue she had with the credits? She just wants her clients to be the stars of the film. Even though so she wanted her clients to be the stars yeah, of the film. And you put kind of everyone in fairly. It, it's, it's perfectly reasonable for an agent to look after their clients like that. That's yeah. not a problem. But it just wasn't put in the contract for this type of credit sequence. And uh, so I think that it kind of came back. It went back and forth a bit. My producer sort of said, well, look, you know, she, she, she'd sent this, um, the agent had sent an email saying, you, you know, you said here that you put this person as the star, and then there's a clause that this same agent put in the contract saying anything discussed in an email is rescinded, mm. so it didn't matter. So, yeah, it kind of went around for a bit. And but that so you so had we, a brilliant producer then. It was a very good producer. Yeah. We had a really good thing. But what it boiled down to was uh, the same thing, saying we're going to take this to court. And we thought, well, we can't. You haven't got anything. It can't take legal action. But it turns out because something's not in a contract, it does leave room for a conversation. And this is a low-budget film where people, where some people are getting paid a lot less than they deserved. I, like, I'd be damned if some money's going to go into legal proceedings mm. just to sort, sort, sort out someone's ego. So I said, ah, you know what, nah. So the credits are in or they're out, you decide. And they said, take them out. So none of the actors get the cool so credits. No credits. I do. <laughs> the cinematographer does. The producer does. You know, the colorist does. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but none of, the, none of the cast, which I think is a shame because, you know, at the very least... I cleverly did the credits so that it didn't have the character name. Mm. So any of the actors could just go, oh, it's my name. I could stick this at the front of a showreel. So at the beginning of a showreel, you're going to do his face melting off, ah, and then phew, his name, yeah. rest of his showreel. So I thought that would be kind of like a nice little gift to the actors who were yeah. also working for less money than we, we than they normally would. But you know, it doesn't matter how nice you are. Sometimes someone just wants to swing their privates around. <laughs> <laughs> What happens yeah. sometimes? What happens? It's alright. It's fine. Yeah. These Welcome happen. to the movie business. Yeah, there's always something. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I guess that's the reason why you want to get stuff in writing at the beginning yeah. and agree all the details of everything while you're having a nice, happy yeah. conversation about, yeah. isn't this exciting? We're making a film. We're all loving Sign this, this idea. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Let's talk about the details yeah. of what do you want in terms of a credit? What do you want in terms of money? What happens if we disagree about what we're doing creatively here? Yeah. Let's decide now, because at the end of the day, once you get into a dispute and you hate each other, that's when it's yeah. a lot harder to agree what what you're going to do about it. Mm. Yeah, because yeah. even though like we make efforts to avoid those sort of things, it's yeah. yet it happened. It's like, oh, aren't we all working on the same film together? This is strange. Yeah. yeah. It happens. It really does. And of course, the point is that, you know, if this ever came, come, well, I mean, I'm sure you agree, if it ever comes to it that this is argued uh, in a court of law, what they will do is try and find out the intention of the parties as is evidenced by the written contract or the emails. They're not trying to find out what was intended behind 
you know, what may have been intended. Mm, so between the lines. Yeah, if you then say, well, actually, I didn't mean, you know, we signed the agreement, but I didn't mean to, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, what what is the agreement that's reached between the party as is evidenced in the contract? So it's just so important that if there's anything you disagree with, you discuss it with mm. your negotiating yeah. th uh, the other half. Mm. Or if you don't understand anything, just ask for clarification. Mm. And don't assume that, you know, if you get something from an established producer or director or scriptwriter, that they're going <coughs> to uh, have all this nailed down, has everything has everything as it should be in the contract, won't, you know, won't have any ambiguity, all this kind of thing. It's not, it, you know, it's always really, really good just to say, look, what does this actually mean? What do you intend by this? And if they can just send you an email back saying, this is what I'm thinking, yeah. that then becomes evidence you can rely on in court. And actually, when you said that, you know, you said oh, they rescinded, um, there was no, the provision in the, in the contract that said, any, you know, this, yeah, any written correspondence, you know, this is the entire agreement. I think that's what yeah. it's, it's yeah. usually referred to as. That doesn't automatically mean that any court is going to throw out the email evidence, but it will it will come into play and, and people will think, well, actually, you know, what exactly was, you know, yeah. what exactly is going on there? But it doesn't actually mean that not ha the email is, is, is thrown out in, in its entirety. So it is, you know, it is worth getting it right. I think. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it came down to the fact that it was a conversation in court. And I just, you know, for me, I felt morally any money that was going to be put into the film in that sense should probably go as little bonuses to people that worked hard, which is what we try to do if our films come in under budget. Um, and yes, yeah, so it was just me going, you know what, I, I can live with this, take mm. it out, it's fine, it's not a problem. Mm. And, and all those actors I work with anyway, so they've got those, actually all of those actors, sans the, uh, the agents, actors unfortunately, were in the next film, so they still got that credit yeah. and they're all wearing cowboy hats, so it's fine. Mm. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> cowboy hats and shooting guns. Exactly. Brilliant. So yeah, I guess it comes down to a moral question sometimes, yeah. yeah. But with, 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 with contracts, if, if you sign one, but it was worded in, in such a way that you didn't understand it. Like, for example, there was a bit of like jiggery-pokery there and there was some kind of small print stuff. Are you still legally obliged to honour it? Unfortunately, yeah. So read your contracts before you... Like Theo said, make sure you understand what's in there. If you read something and it's a bit of legal jargon, maybe sometimes there's even Latin in it, <laughs> ask, just ask, because you, if you don't know what it means, you don't know what you're signing yourself up for. Um, so yeah, and if, if they say to you, uh, well, what I meant when I said I'll pay you 100 quid is I'll pay you a grand, uh, then change it. You know? If the contract doesn't seem to reflect the agreement that you have in place, that you understand uh, was agreed between all the parties, cross it out. Mm -hmm. Say, I need this to change because it doesn't look like it says what we're agreeing to. Yeah. Yeah, have you seen any examples where someone's been stung by the small print? Hundreds, yeah. Yeah? Absolutely, yeah, hundreds and hundreds. And actually then it becomes a sort of, you know, you know, this is a community issue where, you know, how can you possibly enforce this, you know, be in a position where you're actually enforcing this wholly ridiculous measure. Unfortunately, there is very, very little under statute which, you know, govern the, the way in which, you know, the laws of the country that would override the kind of contracts that you're entering into which are essentially matters of civil civil law yeah. Um, yeah in other jurisdictions there might be i know that in, in france you can yeah you have a lot more rights uh, a lot more terms are implied into contracts and you can go back to statute and say well uh this isn't fair so actually as much as i've signed this agreement i'm not going to yeah. stand by it but in english law there's a principle of if you've agreed to it in a contract then you stick by it you're even allowed to sign up for really unfair terms mm, yeah. and it as a system it works because it means that you can you can do a bad deal you know what on the face of it is a bad deal you're getting paid really badly you're getting no credits but for you was a great deal because you get to work with that filmmaker who's going to make your career mm. it might have made sense for you to sign that contract you should have a right to sign up yeah. to a bad deal didn't Johnny Hill yeah. get paid something like 30,000 pounds for the Wolf of Wall Street and he signed that anyway just for the chance to be a leading role in a Scorsese movie. So sometimes you can get undervalued even if you are yeah. a star, but yeah. it can pay off in the long run. Yeah. Is that fair to say? That's Alec Guinness did that in Star Wars. He got like 1% of earnings and took a big pay cut to do it. And like the thing, a big chunk of his fortune was made off that. 1%. Mm. His family is still making money off that. Yeah. It's like 1%. It's a, it's a very small amount, but that's how much revenue Star Wars billion generates. Dollar that one franchise. film as well, not all of them, just the first one. Yeah. It's about 1% wow. of what? I think that's a common yeah. mistake. Yeah. So again, read your contract, understand it. When it says you get a percentage of profits, 
a percentage of which is it chunk? gross, I think. So yeah, is, is that, it that's gross the first one, or right? is it net? Yeah. Are you? What, what, it, what's the difference between gross and net? <laughs> gross includes everything. Includes kind of um, uh, is the full amount of money before you've paid off some other people. So, for example, before you've paid tax, before you've paid the sales agent, before you've paid the collection agent, and then you go into net profits, which is the real pie that's getting divided between everyone. Mm. And when you're in net profits, oftentimes there's a provision which will say, of the net profits, a certain amount goes to the financier, a certain amount goes to the producer. And then it's a share of the producer's share that goes to the talent. You might think you've got 3% and think, that's great, that's a huge amount. No, what you've got is 3% of 50% of a, a <laughs> share after everyone else has been paid. Much smaller amount of money, and you've got to understand where you sit in that, what, what's called the waterfall of how people get paid. Mm. Well, I think back on Star Wars, I don't know why I know so much about Star Wars accounting. <laughs> I <think> but, Star <laughs> Star. <laughs> Star Wars did. but Return of the Jedi, there was more net that was involved in that. But then when that film finished, Lucasfilm had to keep going as a business. So all of the money from that went into Lucasfilm as a business. So there were no net profits as such. Wow. They were able to find work away, not deliberately, but it's just that that money went into keeping a company that then made sort of like, you know, Howard the Duck and Willow and those films didn't make as much money as Star Wars. And so that was, I think that was where it struggled a little bit to, to generate enough net profits. So Return of the Jedi really didn't pay off as much as the first one did. Um, and, and of course it was net profits, not gross, which is what I think Alec Guinness got. Mm. Um, so every toy, every anything, he had a sort of percent that I think the one percent covered all of that, and that was when most of the money was made. Uh, but for Return of the Jedi, yeah, everyone was on net profits. I think Lucas got uh, yeah. his lawyers got a bit smarter <laughs> <laughs> toward the end. It, so say I've 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 made a film with with my brother, for example. For example. For, for example, <laughs> say I've made a film with my brother, <coughs> the writers group. Um, so small plug there. Um, so say I've made a film and, and, and we've put 50% of the money in e either side and we split it right down the middle. We say, right, yeah, you're going to take 50% of the profits if we, if we ever sell this movie and you're going to take 50%. And then I turn around and say, well, I was in the movie and I wrote it, so now I want 70% of it and you can have 30 because you directed it. This was all in a verbal agreement. How much weight does that carry? And, you know, are verbal contracts worth the non-existent contracts they're written on? I'm just thinking, you just wrote it and acted in it, and you won 70%. <laughs> <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> hypo Hypothetically. But, yeah, is there, is there any danger in verbal contracts? Yeah, I mean, I think you absolutely want to avoid a situation where it's your word against theirs. Um, you need to be able to point to something, whether it's what happened next, whether it's, I don't know, just, just write it down. Um, you know, and you know what? There are templates out there that are very... They're very easy to find, they're very easy to adapt. Um, unions such as ours will make those available to you um, and help you draft with the drafting of those. So it's not it's not something like, as I think you were saying, your first tax return. Mm. Um, <laughs> that, that you know you should be, you should be worried about it. Once you've got it in place, it will kind of it can be a bit daunting to start exactly, off with a contract. Yeah, you can get it. But you know what, when we're talking about the the, the statute, um, change may be around the corner because we are lobbying at the moment for the European Copyright Directive. And if that goes through, which it is almost certainly going to before we uh, leave the European Union in March, um, we that will actually offer scriptwriters and creators of work a right to equitable remuneration from the uses of their work, including online. So even where you have, for example, agreed a low fee and that becomes goes on to be a bestseller and makes a lot of money, there will be some recourse that you'll have to adjust the value gap between your initial contribution and, 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 and the money that's coming in back from the market. So that's a really interesting area to watch, actually. That's great. I didn't um, think that was going to happen. That was one of the things yeah. I was worried about. Well, it, it, was, it was turned down in June, but then it went up again. Um, up against the parliament in September, and now it's going through trialogue. So they're just sorting out the finer detail. Um, but that's it, it's a good area, and it's it's one that we've been lobbying uh, lobbying on. So um, you're up really against some big players, aren't you? Google, Facebook, they're lobbying the other way. They are lobbying the other way. Uh, the, you may have heard the expression, the death of the, in what, the death of the internet, is it? I think they're worried <laughs> that um, you know users will be yeah, unable to share probably. memes, and um, <laughs> you know oh. when when you enclose links, share links, and it will come up with a little picture of a you know cat with a thumbs up kind of thing. <laughs> um, all we're really saying, I think, there's a lot of um, misrepresentation around that actually, and uh, you know. 
actually, I, I don't I don't know the details of their arguments. So yeah. Mm. So, but 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 I, I think I think the point is not that there'll be any further restriction on the rights of people using the internet or using that copyright protected material. Just ensuring that there's remuneration going back to the originators and the creators and the producers yeah. and you know and the writers. Um, I don't know if you, there is there's an analogy to. Um, a photocopying in libraries. If you photocopy a book in a library, there is a fee that gets goes back to the creator. You haven't paid to do that photocopying, but there's just this um, area of law that ensures that creators will get a fee from the photocopying of their work. A lot of very difficult calculations. It's not a per use basis, um, but there's an organisation that literally hands out millions and millions to creators every year um, for for this photocopying levy. So it'd be a similar kind of thing. It'd be collecting management organisations bringing that money back um, to the producers and the authors. And so, Getting paid in this industry can be quite difficult sometimes. I mean, if if, if you're a if you're a freelancer, which many the majority of uh, filmmakers are, you have to invoice for your money. And in my experience, sometimes those invoices can take up to three to four months even to get paid. Um, if if your employer is is taking their sweet sweet time with paying you, is is that legal? And and if if it is, how can we speed up that process? I suppose if that's something you're worried about, you should talk to your employer at the beginning and say, look, I have certain bills to pay. I'm really relying on you paying me at this date. So can we have that as a clause in my contract? Mm. Because this is going to be really important to me. I can't hang about for 90 days or two months or whatever it is it's going to take you to be able to pay me. And then they have an obligation to pay you then. But I know that um, as a lawyer, we send out bills and sometimes they don't get paid for months and months. And unfortunately, it is just a case of chasing people and being like, you remember that, that job we did really well for you? Remember how we saved the day that time for you? Any danger you of getting paid? Pay us? <laughs> yeah. And keep reminding yeah. them and keep chasing them. It's unfortunately sometimes the way it goes. Is, is, that, is it just a case of that's the industry we're in? Because I think we were talking about side of, you know, if a plumber came over to your house and fixed your toilet, or a leaky tap, and then he said, right, that's 300 quid, mate. You said, yeah, you can have it in 147 days. <laughs> he'd, he'd, well, he'd tell you to go do one, wouldn't he? Like, is, is, that, is that just yeah. because it's in the, this industry that that happens? It's, um, I, from what I've noticed, is that people are on a different clock. And I know that some production companies, for example, are reliant on the next job to pay people for the job they're doing now. Because bu when budgets come through, say you've got a budget for something at, say, 40,000, they don't necessarily say, yep, here we go, it's 40,000. That comes through in installments. Mm. And sometimes that financier will struggle to get you that money. So it's kind of a, it's never necessarily someone who's sitting there with money and they can't be bothered to push a button so that it goes into your account. Mm. There's normally reasons. Um, whenever I do commercial work, the standard waiting time is 60 days. That's because that's a month for them to invoice, do a bit of chasing, then that money's in, then they pay you. And uh, as, although that seems unreasonable, if you get regular work with a company like that, doesn't really cause a problem because you've got money coming in for jobs that you kind of forget that you've done in some cases. You've got to kind of really stay on top of it. Mm. But um, I think it's the same thing. You've just got to chase people up. And I mean, I did a job in the summer for a bank, and they paid me this week. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, cool. And it wasn't even much money. Is so you only notice when you go, oh, nice other people have paid. Where you get paid. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just about to send another sort of shitty email, yeah. and I thought, oh, hang on, I should check. <laughs> and I went, oh, no, they've been great, they paid. Yeah. My, yeah. So that All shitty email turned into, thank you so much, I really, really appreciate you sort of working on this, thanks. You know, because again, it's about trying to, as much I find the balance inactive, even though you're perfectly entitled to get paid mm -hmm. for the work you do, you, it can be quite frustrating mm -hmm. to be the person sitting there going, God, we gave this guy one job, and, and he doesn't shut up about it for three, four months. Mm -hmm. So, so pay up and they'll go away. But you've got to do it, and it's a balancing act as a freelancer, I find. Um, and I guess so much of your work is about relationships as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So you don't want to jeopardize that. Yeah. But well, equally, you need to get paid. So yeah, it's, it's I would say at the end balance. of the day, I would say at the end of the day, and if things do get really, really difficult, find out what it means from your contract. What are the provisions relating to your lack of payment? In some cases, particularly in publishing contracts, if you've got a book deal. Um, with a publisher, that will actually allow you to uh, uh, terminate the agreement, which is big, big news. And I know you don't want to be um, damaging relationships by saying, mm. look, if you don't pay me within you know, 30 days, I, I can actually, this agree, I can ask that this agreement falls away, which is a which is tremendously powerful position to be yeah. in. Mm. Obviously not one you 
you know, you wouldn't want to give them the impression that you would do that. But I think just reminding you of that, that was the right that was agreed going back at the start of the arrangement, that mm. kind of thing. But also, um, the other thing is you are allowed under law to uh, charge interest on bad debt. Yes. So, you know, if you sort of say, you know, I will be using my right to charge interest, I, again, it, 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 it's slightly nuanced how you might want to do that just because of the relationship aspect. Mm. Um, but it is worth bearing in mind. And these kind of areas are basically showing that other party that you know you do have that you do have maybe more power than maybe they think you do. Yeah. I think yeah. that's so feeling empowered. The way I've gone around that um, in the past is to say, look, we, we've employed other people and they're starting to add interest onto the late payments that we have to pay them. And that's having a knock-on effect. Yeah. We can hold them off if you can get this payment process quickly, and then usually that happens. Uh, we've never had anyone do that with us because again, we've got good relations with the people we work with. But it's those little threats that. You know, you can do in a benign way. Mm -hmm. That looks like I'm trying to help help me help you. You know that sort of thing, and it and it sort of seems to work. But uh, but the rights are, yeah, you owe me money, and if you don't give it to me, then I can. Ref I think my uh, girlfriend's a freelancer, and she, her sister is, is an accountant, and she just says, oh, I'll write a letter saying that we're going to refer you to a debt collector if you don't pay up. Is that usually and they like pay a fire up within up under twelve hours. hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because that's the scary thing where it's like, yeah. oh wow. So it, that sort of happens mm. um like i have another friend who's worked for a company and they went into liquidation and his advice was go down stay in their payroll department do not leave until they put that money in your account because that might they, they're, they're going out of business yeah. they'll just want to go home at the end of the day and if you're not letting them because you're not leaving until they haven't resolved a the problem they'll do it just to get you out of the office it's like almost like a peaceful protest sort of thing yeah to get it, it worked though. that guy got a good few thousand that he was owed from a company that had you know wow. gone into liquidation yeah wow. yeah so it's very odd. There's so many weird scenarios you find yourself in. I think that's where the good things are freelancers, just to make sure you get lots of different work from different places, mm. so that when one when one sort of section is starting to crumble a little bit, you've still got other work, and you can go softly, softly there, because you can afford to. And put if you're relying on that, then you're in trouble, and you're going to be very desperate and keen and yeah. aggressive, and you'll get the money eventually, probably. But you know that that work relationship goes. And, yeah. It's hard. It's hard balance. I really wouldn't know how to. Uh, this is the way I do it, and it works for me. Yeah. Uh, you've got to find your own way of doing it, I guess. That that issue of 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 striking the balance between like knowing your worth and getting paid, but also trying to maintain relationships and not piss people off at the same time is very difficult. And I guess it pertains to when you're just starting out. Um, I I did a kids cartoon show. And it was a voiceover, and I was I had a buyout where I was getting paid per hour. So I was doing sometimes four to five shows in an hour. And then they would then use that indefinitely. So, you know, that that in, in that case it was like kind of hugely undervalued. So if anyone's starting out in a situation where they're offered a contract where it's like in some ways extortionate for them to do it, but they still want to get the exposure, how how can how can a performer who's just starting out uh, get more money for their work? Or is it Impossible is that is that is that market just totally cornered off? I think is what you guys were saying earlier is that um, make sure it's in the contract early on, and I think you summed it up perfectly. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what you said. It was um, depending on where you are in your career. Yeah. That can yeah, know know your worth. I think it can be really difficult when you're first starting out. Um, because unfortunately, there are so many situations where people get underpaid mm. at the beginning of their careers. Um, but the further along you go, the more powerful you become in a lot of ways, and the more you can turn around and walk away and say, no, you, you need me in this. Mm. So unless you pay me more, I'm not going to do this work. And it's really, it's not so much a legal question, it's more of a commercial one of, can, can you negotiate a better deal? Yeah. Um, so understand what you're getting offered. Uh, understand in that situation, you might have thought, I'm a, I'm a student. It's great to make this bit of money right now because I need to pay my rent today. That works really well for me. And later on, you might have thought, do you know what? It, that was a bit rubbish. I mm. wish I had asked for more. Mm. So think ahead. Think about what you think you are worth and make sure you're getting paid that. So you don't have the shitty feeling of, God, they really mm. exploited me here. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's, yeah. Fear? I just think it's an interesting to think of those, that that relationship as one of shared risk. If you're being asked to give the greater risk than, say, the producer, for example, or the or the scriptwriter, then I think, you know, you have to. So if you're the one sort of saying, well, actually, I'm going to do this work, and I'm going, I'm not going to, I'm going to take a lower fee for it, um, 
I that means you know I'm kind of sharing more of a risk because otherwise you would need to spend more for the market if you were doing this at mm. market rate. Um, but I'm prepared to do that, provided that on the back end, you know, the royalty payments are higher, so that if my risk pays off, I do better. I'm rewarded for having taken that risk, in other words. And that works both ways, I think. If you're, if the if the producer or is the one that is showing the investment and saying, look, I'm taking a lot of risk here, I'm putting a lot of throwing a lot of money at this, um, then it's only right that they get, mm. you know, maybe maybe the 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 you know the appropriate yeah, share yeah. on on the on the on the back end. So. Um, so yeah, so right. yeah. I think I think we're almost coming to an end here. But so before I throw it out there for some audience questions, um, I'd like to just g ask you guys if you could give everyone out there one piece of practical advice um, that they could take away from this to do to move their careers forward. What would it be? For me, it's get it in writing. You know, and and think ahead. Think about um, dispute resolution clauses. How have you agreed together? Um, all the points that you think you've agreed or have you just sat in the pub and gone yeah let's make a film mm. and later on not thought about how we're going to sell it how we're going to exploit it are we going for these types of festivals are we going for those types of festivals who has creative control over this piece of work that <coughs> we're doing together who gets paid what shares when mm -hmm. all those kind of points think about them talk about them honestly at the beginning get it in writing awesome Thea yeah. and I think you know it, yeah, in, in light of that, and I'd also, I'd also su suggest that you just have a little bit of a think about what um, is important to you in the context of the agreement that's being offered. Um, uh, your negotiating partner may not agree to everything, but they may show a flexibility on certain points, so just think about whether you want to push for that credit over and above um, remuneration, whether you whether it's more important to you that your career to get your word out there is, as I think, you know, Wolf of Wall Street again. Is, yeah. You know, if you think that's, if that's what you're valuing in the, in the partnership over and above, being paid for it, and, and that's what you're getting this arrangement for, well, maybe you know, that's how you would go get about that negotiation and say, well, actually, I really, really must insist upon this credit, um, but then not focus so much on getting the money for it, just in recognition of the fact that that's what you want out of the arrangement and the priorities. Just think about what your priorities are and yeah. don't see the agreement as one overarching wholesale thing where you're going through every point that, that you know, just think about what it means in practice, essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's this, it's the same thing as, as what you guys were saying, except I think I, think I was going to sort of aim it straight at. If you're making a film and you've got someone's face in it, don't assume that they'll sign that release form to use their face <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Make them sign it before they go in front of a camera. And I don't care if it means sending someone and it delays your shoot for 20 minutes because someone's going to go and buy a pen from the nearest shop, which is, you know, uh, this is a 10 minute walk down the road. Mm do that because that's the one thing I think a lot of young filmmakers neglect and they think, oh no, we're all friends. You'd be amazed how much some of that, and I've been very lucky this hasn't happened to me, but I've seen it happen to so many people and there's some great films sitting on shelves right now because someone didn't get uh, really a small. very small yeah. character to sign something and they haven't had the budget to go and reshoot that with another actor yet. Wow. And you know, so it's, it's, it's just, that's the one thing. Get, mm -hmm. get your release form signed by anyone who's in, whose face is in your film because they've got power over your whether you release that paper. or not. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Brilliant, guys. Well, um, this is an opportunity now. If you have any burning questions out there, just please raise your hand and we'll get a mic out if you'd like to ask our expert panel any questions. <laughs> I think we've got one right there. You can start there. Brilliant. Well, you kind of, yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, hi there. Uh, I was just wondering if you could tell us um, more about shooting like in public spaces and what does that, um, what do we have to think about that? And in related to that, like about the layers you were mentioning at the beginning of the talk of rights we have to actually keep in mind. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so it's, uh, sorry. Um, oh, go ahead. It was interesting because we weren't actually. I mean, much of the issues about um, filming in public spaces aren't actually to do with copyright. They're to do with um, privacy. So it's the privacy of the people. So the people that are caught in the shots. Um, if you're filming, if you're catching, for example, um, architectural buildings, that kind of thing, that's all covered by a um, exception under copyright law. So you don't need to think about. Well, you know, I've got a building over there. I'm, I'm capturing the gherkin or whatever. Um, you know, I need to clear rights with the owner of that building. That's already provided for. 
but when it comes to shooting with people, and I think this comes back to the consent form, it's to do with privacy. And you know, you, you'll see, um, for example, if you go on um, Google Street View, you see that everyone's faces are, mm. um, you know, are blurred, uh, blurred out. out. They didn't used to be, I don't think. And actually, I think they said. I think I saw a dog's face blurred out. A dog's face blurred out. Oh, yeah. oh wait. Yeah. <laughs> that's how. That's how serious they take privacy. I think what they tried to do, the, the, the rules regarding privacy are quite vague and, and a, a claim can be brought on, with all, or, on almost any factual basis. But I think what Google originally tried to do was to actually have the street view there and say, well, if you want your faces blurred, come to us. Or well, certainly that was the case with living rooms or I, there's something there. And then they said, well, actually, this is too, this is too risky. We're going to blur everyone. Yeah. Um, and so that privacy right, and I think that's really, really important. And even more so in uh, today's... Um, since we've had GDPR, which governs the uh, right to make use of personal data. Um, it, it's, it, um, yeah, so your it image is, is personal data. Your image is personal data. <laughs> so is. you have to be really careful with people. Buildings, I think you're fine. Design rights, we were talking about earlier. If you're filming a flashy Ferrari, if it's just off the production line, it's probably worth thinking about whether or not you need to clear rights with that. But bear in mind that the big organisations and rights holders, um, the big organisations will have organisations that you know, employed staff that are there to deal with these types of queries already. Um, and the other organisations will likely have not have farmed out that, um, uh, that capability to a, uh, another organisation, so a rights clearance organisation, um, who may be able to help you. Um, so I, I don't, do you have any particular areas of, that you're concerned about? Was it just sort of, um, that, that's okay. general I public think another spaces. thing to think about is um, location agreements. If you're in public space that doesn't apply as much but if you're going into a private space say you're walking into a museum or something like that or mm. into a national trust building um you might need to get permissions to use that space but and that's that's more a um real estate kind of proprietary right that that person gets to control how their space is used and you can't go around and use it in a different way without getting their their permission there was an instance with a film uh, that a friend of mine was working on recently, and they were they'd had permission to shoot in the street in public, it was somewhere in Hackney, and they put up signs that said, "If you walk through this area, we're filming. You could be in the film. You walking through this is you giving us permission to do so." Wow. I, and I was like, "Is it?" <laughs> and and because uh, 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 apparently people started coming up and started yelling at the production managers, and they were like, "You would literally, we haven't blocked the street. Up. You can go that yeah. way. Yeah. It's just if you walk this way, you're in the film. If you walk that way, you're not. It's up to you." And uh, yeah, so someone started yeah. yelling, and someone was, I think, there's always someone yelling. Uh, there was some legal action that someone, someone was a lawyer, and, and said this ain't right, and then did yeah. put a call through yeah. over it. Yeah. And sadly, in London, of course, a lot of public space that you think is public isn't public. So mm -hmm. if you're filming out here on the South Bank, that's all private. You'll need permission. If yeah. you're filming on the Tube, you need permission. Um, and a lot of other places. So to, uh, you, ha you have to do your homework mm -hmm. when you're shooting and see if it's, if it's private or public. Private or public. Yeah. There's a closed down yeah. tube station that they use exclusively for filming. So yeah. they have a tube that runs through it and yeah. then you yeah. can shoot scenes there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anybody else who'd like a, like a question? Before we before we say goodbye to our expert panel, I think we've got one and two. I think we've got time for a quick one from both of you. That'd be great. Uh, so, as a um, like as an observational documentary filmmaker, um, I, I'm I'm just starting out. I'm trying to. I want to make sure that I'm covered for anyone that I might that I might film. But let's say I I don't know who. Um, who will appear in the film, and I don't know what will, uh, you know, I, I don't know the content before it actually happens, kind of there in front of me. Um, what what advice would you give, would you give to me for making sure I'm covered for for doing that sort of work? I, I think your your medium is generally a little safer when it comes to things like blurring out faces. So if someone's face was to be blurred out who was just a passerby in the street, no one's going to look at that and go, you're a terrible filmmaker, you made a mistake there. But there's uh, the sequel to Birdemic, if anyone saw that trashy masterpiece. Um, there's scenes of the main character walking through LA, and it's just like everyone's face is blurred <laughs> out in the crowd. It's really it's, soft focus. It's, no, it's <laughs> they're just their faces blurred out. So it looks really jarring and weird and strange and definitely bad filmmaking. You could get away with it with documentaries a bit with more. Documentary, with documentary, no one bats an eye yeah. over a, a blurred face. Pitch you know. down the voices, blur the faces. But I assume everyone you right. interview, you're going to have permission to yeah. do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you you kind of, I think you've got a safer medium to work in, if that makes any yeah. sense. You can Thank always you. catch them and get them to sign an, a release form just afterwards, mm. straight away. They've walked through and you think, oh my God, that's the person we didn't get. Mm. Let's catch them right now, if you can. Yeah. There's a thing as well, when you say, um, before you ask them any questions, if this is like a Vox Pop scenario, you can say, okay, uh, can you just state your name and say that you're happy for us to use this footage in our documentary? And they go, okay, uh, um, my name is Mark Price and I'm happy for you to use this in whatever way you see fit in your documentary. Like, that's something that we would do for Vox Pops. Um, again, you learn so much of this stuff through people saying you should do it, but a lot of it comes from producers who don't really know what they're talking about. So I'm not sure how genuinely legal this stuff is <laughs> sometimes. Give it a try. But it falls into the yeah. whole email sort of thing where if they've said, yeah, I'll do this in an email, they've literally said it. Right. So, right. But I, you know, I, I saw... I think we've got time for one more question I saw up here. Um, how do trademarks work, and is, and is that something you should think about when creating your content? Uh, I think it, it's something you need to think about. The, um, so just just to just to say that the there is a the register of trademarks is publicly available on, online, so you can just do a search and you can look fairly quickly whether or not uh, something that you want to use is trademarked. Um, the way trademarks work is that they are. They protect the use of that mark in a certain way. It doesn't. So, what I mean is, if you're writing a book, you can say the name Coca-Cola in, in writing the book. It doesn't. It doesn't extend that far. The monop it, it doesn't extend so far as a monopoly right. It will protect the use of that name in a certain category to avoid any. Um, so, if, if if I if I'm you know head of Coca-Cola and I've 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 invested a lot of money over the years in building goodwill in that brand. So if, if, if someone else comes in and, and, and uses the Coca-Cola trademark and says, well, actually, you know, this is, um, you, know, um, you know, giving that impression that I've been endorsed or making use of the goodwill in that brand. So if we have big kind of Coca-Cola up here and, you know, we're sort of saying, you know, we're actually, we're actually benefiting from that in a way that is, is maybe deemed unfair at law. And if that, that's tr because that's trademarked, um, we wouldn't be able to use that in the certain categories that they have it um, protected for. Someone like Coke probably does have it protected in loads of categories. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, you'll be actually be quite surprised by how restrictive those um, trademark categories are. So, for example, a maker of coffee may, may be uh, restricted to, they may be, have the right to use that name in the context of selling hot drinks. Um, anywhere else, you're kind of fair game. All right. Yeah, but then I'm working on a, um, a music documentary at the moment with um, a band that's very well known, and their Who? name nearly caught me. <laughs> their name is trademarked, um, so we've had to get a trademark license from the band, um, and they have four different marks that need to be used in a particular way, um, and they've given us particular instructions about when it moves in this way, you have to have this mark followed by that mark in these colours if you're going to use it on screen. Um, so it's definitely worth thinking about. Yeah, board mess. Yeah. Oh. Um, that you don't want that name to flash up in a way that breaches their rights um, because then they have a claim against you. Guys, I think that's all we have time for for our expert panel. So why don't we give them a round of applause? Emily, Theo and Mark. Really. Guys, when you have a sit down and then we're going to invite the, uh, the uh, screen them up. So yeah, just go have a seat, relax, That's take a load much. off. Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention that there's some freebies knocking about. So if you feel like some half price tickets for next month's event, all you have to do is go to the box office today and you can get them. And if you feel like winning a one terabyte rugged mini hard drive, you can win that today. All you need to do is find one of our Future Film Labs guys, give them an email, and we will pick a winner out of the hat up in the blue room when we're all having some drinks a little bit later. So right now, it is time to introduce our Hive Film of the Month. So why don't we welcome on stage Erin Kaplan and Michael Navarro. Come on stage, guys. Round of applause, guys. Is that Michael up there? Yeah, he's coming down. Come on, Michael, get down here. Come on, come on. So here we have Erin, who's the director, writer, co-writer of, of our film here. And here we have Michael, who's also hey. a co-writer. Hello, nice to meet and you editor. guys. And, and editor yeah. as well. Wow, <laughs> yeah. Amazing, amazing skill. So guys, why don't you tell us a bit about the movie, how it came about, what it's about. Yeah. Um, so we start with Michael. Do you want to... um, yeah, so started ages ago from a completely different idea just about a young girl in some post-apocalyptic world and then it kind of evolved 
as things like this do, and became a social realist film about a girl living in a tower block that's due to be demolished and about her relationship with her mother and mm -hmm. relationship with other residents. And did you guys, where did you guys meet? We met at university. You met at uni, so oh, is this yeah. your graduate film? It is. Oh, yeah. brilliant, brilliant. So uh, how long was the whole process from uh, uh, the, the conception of the idea to getting it edited and finished? Oh, God. Um, seven months, I think. Yeah, or even longer. So I think something long. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was quite a long time. And maybe how did you come? How did you guys come in contact? How did you say, "All oh, right, this is a great project. I'd love to direct it." Or were you just in yeah. the same class? Were you thrown together? Um, yeah. So Michael pitched it, and a few people pitched ideas. Yeah. Um, and Michael's one went really far, and I liked it. Yeah. Um, and I thought, you know, I've 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 done a quite quite a lot of sci-fi's and fantasies, mm -hmm. that sort of film, um, and they've all had this kind of social um, theme in them, some yeah. sort of message, political message. And I thought, why don't I? you know, go all out and go for a cheeky social realist, you know. A cheeky um, social yeah. realist, my favourite. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, th I kind of, the idea really spoke to me in some ways. Um, and yeah, well, I, I used to see these, you know, buildings popping up um, in London, in my area. Um, and I never really thought about process. I just thought they popped up mm. and people move on. That's it. Um, but then I looked um, into the subject and I saw that, wait a second, there's no um, kind of understanding for these people. Um, and for, yeah, there was, there's no um, understanding, like there are old people that um, lived there for a long time and they're just picked off, um, scattered all over the country. Um, yeah, um, and, I th and I thought that would be, yeah. Great really interesting yeah, yeah, subject yeah. matter yeah, to yeah, discover, yeah. definitely. Mm. And uh, how did you guys end up funding it? Um, through crowdfunding mostly, yeah. So it was we just put up a was it a crowdfunder or go? It was a uh, yeah crowdfunder, 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 yeah, crowdfunder, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and yeah, just like made a little kind of got the virtual video. tin cup out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Made a little like pitch video and sent it around to everyone we could and. Had social media and how much like did you end up raising for it? For the thousand, I think. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's fantastic. Thousand, wow, yeah. that's amazing. It's a yeah. great feeling when uh, you feel that people actually want to see your project, don't you? It's yeah. really nice and humbling. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, guys. Really looking forward to seeing it. Have you guys got anything else coming up? Any other movies that we should know about? Any other projects in the pipeline? Um, yeah, well, I'm just working on writing things at the moment. Mm -hmm. so not anything kind of in motion, but yeah. the beginnings. How about you, Aaron? Um, I'm working on a few music videos. Awesome. Um, and um, I'm kind of taking a break away from short films because we did that for about three years constantly. Took a big, big yeah. part of your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cheat a little break and then um, and hopefully go back, Brilliant. back into it. Well, you've got a room full of creatives here who will be very interested, I'm sure, in talking to you upstairs yeah. after we get, we get our drink on. So um, without further ado, why don't we start the movie, guys? Round of applause for the creators here. Erin. Michael. Should we have a seat, guys? Yeah, let's sit down.